Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. My name is Michael O'Mealy, and I'm a senior associate in climate change adaptation here at APT Associates. And before we begin, I'd like to say a little about this webinar series, which is entire, entitled New Perspectives on Building Resilience, uh, being hosted by our Risk and Resilience Center here at APT Associates. And the series started in October and is running through April to explore how using a risk and resilience framework can help governments and their partners effectively target resources to improve the lives of the most vulnerable people around the world by reducing their risk and increasing their resilience at the individual, household, and community level. And each session in the series is focusing on a number of different key policy areas, uh, ranging from housing and community development to mental health and health financing, to asset building and economic sustainability in the face of climate change, which is the focus of our session today. And more information on the series is available at APP's website, which you see here on the slides. So before we dive into our topic today, I'd like to say that it's an incredible honor for me to be here with my very good friend and colleague, John Furlow, a climate change specialist in USAID's Global Climate Change Office, and one of the people who I truly respect most in leading our thinking and our practice in this critical area uh, for all of us really working on these issues as a global community. And it's also a tremendous honor for me to be here with all of you, everyone who has joined us via webinar, Thank you so much for the work that you are doing around the world uh, on these critical issues and for being here with us today. Uh, we very much look forward to your thoughts and questions after the brief introduction that John and I are going to give. And so I'd like to start maybe just by setting the stage with some of the overarching types of risks that communities and governments are facing around the world related to climate change, including both direct and indirect impacts. So we know from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and its recent reports that current greenhouse gas, uh, that with current greenhouse gas emission rates, the world is on pace to warm up to 4.8 degrees Celsius or 8.6 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of this century compared with pre-industrial levels. And with that amount of warming, we could see sea levels rise by up to two meters by 2100, flooding many major coastal cities, making many small island nations uninhabitable, and pushing salt water into freshwater aquifers that are critical sources of drinking water for millions of people around the world. In addition, we will continue seeing more frequent and intense storms, changing precipitation patterns and higher air temperatures, all of which are going to pose greater and greater threats to agriculture and food security. In urban areas, we expect to see more frequent and intense heat islands, uh, which will aggravate air pollution and continue to threaten people's health. And as oceans absorb more carbon, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, the ocean pH will become more and more acidic, uh, threatening the viability of organisms at the base of the marine food chain and leading to potentially catastrophic impacts on marine ecosystems, alongside the parallel shifts we are already seeing on land in terrestrial ecosystems and species distributions. And these environmental changes are already affecting the things that people depend on in nearly every country and community around the world, from food production to infrastructure stability, from local livelihoods to overall economic and social well-being particularly for populations uh, that are most vulnerable and have the least resources to prepare and adapt. So when we think about what um, resilience means with regard to climate change, uh, we often define resilience as the capacity of people to decrease the impact of events that negatively affect their health, livelihoods, and human development. And in the context of climate change, strengthening resilience means ensuring that people's commu people, communities, businesses, and other organizations are able to cope with both current climate variability, meaning what's happening with the climate right now, as well as adapt to future climate change, meaning what we know and expect is coming. 
and adapting in a way that ideally reduces chronic vulnerabilities and facilitates inclusive economic growth and sustainability. This ability to adapt, which we often call adaptation capacity, is critical to preserving the development gains that countries have made in recent decades and to minimizing the damages and impacts associated with climate change that countries and communities are experiencing now and that they will be living with for centuries to come. Little click through here, our bullets. Um, so a key question that we're looking at today and something we'd like to hear about from all of you joining us via webinar uh, so that we can kind of learn and discuss these issues together is how are governments and their development partners around the world working to strengthen the resilience of local communities and local and national economies to the impacts of climate change? And John is going to share some really good thoughts from his experiences in a moment, as well as the new framework and approach that USAID is using. But first, I'd like to just give a few examples from work that John and I have both done with small island nations in the Eastern Caribbean, many of which are tremendously vulnerable to climate change impacts and are providing really valuable examples of what can be done in other countries and regions of the world to strengthen climate change resilience. And that really starts with understanding impacts of climate change, including strengthening a country's access to and use of data on how the climate is changing and what can be done to adapt to those changes. And with that information, governments and communities can plan for both immediate and longer term needs to build their capacity to take strategic actions, including leveraging resources with private sector partners to pilot and then scale up successful on-the-ground approaches. In the work that I've done most recently with island nations in the Eastern Caribbean, we piloted approaches that really ran the full spectrum of adaptation measures, including taking, act taking actions to reduce flooding and coastal erosion, improve how water resources were managed, um, help uh, farms and businesses transition to more climate resilient agriculture, uh, improve protections for marine and coastal resources, and strengthen the ability of communities and governments to access greater financing for these actions, and have the peer-to-peer -peer sharing and learning that needs to occur at all levels. So with that, uh, with those examples, I'd like to formally introduce John, and then turn it over to him to talk about USAID's new framework and his experiences working with countries and communities on these issues. Uh, John Furlow is the USAID Climate Change Team's Leader on Impacts and Adaptation in Developing Countries. He led the development of USAID's Climate Resilient Development Framework. He manages global programs that provide adaptation assistance to countries worldwide. And he travels quite regularly to work on the ground with governments, stakeholders, and USAID missions around the world on efforts ranging from climate vulnerability assessment to project design and planning. John, thank you so much again for being here today. I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Michael, and thanks to everybody out there online. Um, I really appreciate being invited to participate, and I appreciate everybody uh, joining us. I hope that at the end of the hour, you're glad that you've um, you spent your time talking with and listening to Michael and me. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit about the climate and development strategy. Uh, we developed this in 2000. We released it in 2012. We began developing it really in 2009 or 2010, um, and the part that uh, I was most engaged in and that continues to guide my work is the section on uh, on adaptation. Um, it's part two of the, if you if you read the, the strategy, it's, it's part two. Um, I think the main thing that I want to say about this is that we want to, the, the purpose of trying to adapt is to help countries continue on their development pathway uh, despite climate change. And so, as Michael said, that involves understanding the impacts and the changes that are taking place, but it also requires uh, understanding what's important from a development perspective. So it's really weaving together um, climate risks, uh, understanding of climate risks and ways of addressing them with uh, good, solid development. 
Um, as it says there on the screen, one of the ways that climate resilient development is different from traditional development is that we're, we're looking across time scales. We're concerned about what's happening now, but we know that the operating environment that economic and livelihood activities are taking place in is changing. Uh, rainfall patterns are changing, rainy seasons are changing, temperatures are changing. Um, and so helping people to understand that and what it means for their livelihood activities is what we're really talking about here. Um, I wanted to say uh, one thing about the resilience definition that Michael gave, um, and that is when we began, the agency also has a resilient, a resilience strategy, um, which some of you may have seen, or resi resilience policy. And we heard from a lot of people that our resilience definitions weren't quite right. And I think it's because we were working from an engineering definition, which basically says that things you build will survive. And we were also working with ecological definitions, which basically say that after a shock or after an event, things will bounce back to where they were before. But we're talking about development. And like I said, we want to keep communities, um, households, countries on a development pathway, not simply bounce back to where they were before, but uh, help them to continue to grow despite these shocks. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Climate Resilient Development Strategy, or sorry, excuse me, Climate Resilient Development Framework, um, which we uh, put out back in, I think, in March or April. Um, we developed it for the last four or five years through working in different countries. The first place we got to, to test the ideas behind it was in Barbados, before Michael arrived there. Um, but the ideas behind this, well, as you can see, there's, um, there's five steps or stages in the framework. Scope, assess, design, implement, and manage, evaluate, and adjust. The latter four are consistent with any de development uh, project cycle. Um, I think where we differentiate ourselves is in the first one, scope. And we realized through some of our early work that when we talked with stakeholders about climate risks, if we started talking to them about climate change, it intimidated a lot of the people that we needed to reach. It intimidated farmers. It intimidated agricultural extension workers. It, intended, it intimidated coastal managers. It felt like that was somebody else's problem. Um, we also got hung up in the idea that climate change is something that would happen in the future, and so we don't need to deal with it now. We, need, we would hear, oh, we need to deal with our basic development problems before we get to climate. So we started thinking, and we also saw, um, we did some work in Madagascar before the coup, and realized that they were developing some of their development strategies in stovepipes. They had a transportation plan. They had a, a conservation plan. They had an agriculture plan. And they had competing uh, interests, competing ambitions for the next decade. Um, they wanted to, I'm, I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but basically in the Madagascar Action Plan, they talk about, I think it's doubling rice, protect, rice production, tripling protected area coverage, tripling road coverage, all while doubling or tripling incomes, per capita income. When you look at a map of Madagascar, which is already severely degraded, um, the places where people were looking to do all of those things tended to be the same places. And they were, were the places that were still forested. Um, when well, you can't conserve a forest, uh, build a road to get tourists there, grow rice and other agricultural products there, and expand livestock all in the same plot of land and keep it looking the same. And they hadn't talked across components of the economy. So we started thinking, OK, it would be better to have a conversation across multiple components of the economy and discuss what are the development objectives. Let's push the discussion of climate risk to later in the process. If we, What I just put up was a kind of a framework or a, a flowchart of, of the conversation that we like to have with stakeholders. We ask, what are the development objectives that you're that are in the interest of your country or your government? Um, what are the requirements for achieving those developments? If you want to improve agricultural productivity, then you need land, labor, capital in the traditional economic sense. You need other inputs, fertilizer, water, etc. You need land tenure. You need the ability to borrow and invest. You need a functioning market. So what are all of those things that go into making a sector of the economy capable of growing? And then we talk about what are the risks of impediments, risks and impediments. Some are going to be climatic, but the non-climate ones are also very important. 
um, if we come in with our climate funding and only address the climate risks and there are other unaddressed problems, we're probably not going to achieve the outcomes that we want. Mm -hmm. um, and so we push the discussion of climate until later in the day or later in the process so that people can get comfortable talking about what they know and where their expertise lies. And then we bring them into the climate discussion after discussion of what do we mean by climate change and climate variability. And often they know, they may not use the same terminology that we would use, but they do understand how they've already been affected and they do understand what their concerns are going forward. They've experienced a drought, they've experienced a flood, they've experienced a heat wave, things like that. Then we talk to them about solutions. Now that's, that's really bringing together the scope and assess stage and a little bit of the design phase. Uh, that's not to say we don't do, want to do a more detailed vulnerability assessment at some point, but you don't always need one. If one of the glaring problems in that, in that impediments problem or the constraint box is that the MET service does not provide useful information to farmers, then you need to start talking to the MET service about the weather service, about what information could they provide farmers, how do farmers receive information. So you want to, we're also, a, a, a fully blown vulnerability assessment can be time and cost intensive. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you can only undertake that investment when you have to and make sure that you've alleviated all of the easier to address constraints sooner, uh, you may get a better outcome. As an example, climate service, I was just mentioning, um, we, we walk through this process with the Jamaican government. The J Jamaican government asked us to help them develop a national climate policy. It was the first opportunity we had to bring mitigation and adaptation together, and it was the first chance we had to, to really work with very top levels of a government. Um, we did a huge workshop right before the Olympics in 2012 started. The Prime Minister asked us to do it. The, the workshop was kicked off by the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Environment jointly. Um, we started with about 120, 150 people, and we got down to working groups of about 85 or 90, working at small tables, taking apart Jamaica's national development strategy. It's called Vision 2030. It's online. Um, and trying to understand the hierarchy of things, how the elements of their uh, development strategy have to fit together, what happens to happen first, and where does climate come in to, and run the risk of interrupting the achievements that they're trying to make. Um, one of the things that came out very clearly was that uh, the Weather Service was not providing the information that its potential clients in the Ag Ministry, the Forestry Department, the Water Authority, the Port Authority, the Airport Authority, uh, they weren't getting the information they needed. And we realized that the the Weather Service was having problems providing that information. So we met with a bunch of stakeholders, brought them together, and began working on uh, what the needs were. And last January, we, we pulled together, we helped pull together, the Jamaicans did all the work, but we pulled together a team from the, uh, the MET Service and the Agricultural Extension Service, and they developed a tool for farmers with an eye on what farmers needed. It's a drought forecast tool. You can look at it online. I did not bring the address, the web address with me, but if you Google it, you might find it. Um, and it's become very popular. I think several hundred farmers are receiving text messages from the Weather Service now about the seasonal forecast. It looks out three months. It's a drought forecast. It's really a rainfall forecast. Um, it has since been taken across the Caribbean. It was used this past year as they prepared for what turned out to be not a very severe hurricane season. Um, and so we've done a lot of work uh, with partners at Columbia University on trying to really match weather and climate information to the, the needs and the decision-making styles of the, the clients of the MET service. I think I'm going long, so I will just very briefly say that another example of where we've applied this framework is in the urban context. Um, we basically asked what, what are the services people want when they live in a city? You know, you want garbage collection, you want transportation, you want water and electricity, et cetera. Um, we asked how do, you, how do cities provide those services? Um, what are the stresses and constraints that undermine those services and then what can we do about them? We've been running pilots in, as you can see, the Dominican Republic, two cities in Peru, Mozambique, and then in Vietnam we introduced a decision support tool and a, a, 
a visualization tool. We tested it in, in Hue, and the Vietnamese government has asked to expand it to 65 more cities. I believe they're going to do that on their own. Um, we will, we and our, our partner at a company called Cascadia will provide the tool, but uh, the Vietnamese are taking over the process um, and running it themselves. And in the other cities up there, we've um, helped the, the cities produce uh, development plans. All right, I'll leave slightly over time. <laughs> Thanks so much, John. This is a fantastic overview. And you know, maybe to dive into a little bit of conversation here, I'm really interested in, uh, I think we provided a lot of good fodder for people participating on the webinar to jump in, ask some questions, uh, share your experiences, please, of working on these issues around the world so that we can learn from what you're doing and, and talk about this together. But just to kick it off, you know, I really like how, um, I like the five stages outlined in USAID's Climate Resilient Development Framework. Uh, and I, I appreciate the example you gave from your work in Barbados, and it's just great to see how that provides such a solid foundation for countries to work really systematically toward greater resilience. Um, but I'm guessing that also you and and you know all many of us here have also had the experiences that that things rarely are as simple or as easy in real life as they are on paper. Uh, so I'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, what have been some of the more difficult or maybe unexpected challenges you've encountered in working with countries and communities on these issues? Um, I think one of the first is pretty basic but fundamental, um, and that is that we've brought climate change and adaptation in, and we tend to talk about them as if they were a, another development sector, another economic sector. Mm -hmm. And the development agencies of the world are structured mostly around things that we like. We want more food security. We want better global health. We want mm -hmm. better education. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've got this problem, climate change. And we, in aid, we're in an office, and we're, we are structured, and we look a lot like uh, those other topics that I addressed. But it makes it hard for people to get their head around how do you deal with something that cuts across multiple things that we like, and it's this it's this unpleasant stress that's undermining the achievements that we want to achieve. And in governments, they're structured the same way. You have a ministry of, or a department of education, you have a ministry of transportation, uh, agriculture, et cetera. And then they tend to stick climate in the environment office or the environment ministry. And so it's kind of seen as somebody else's problem. And um, in the Jamaica workshop, I believe, uh, at the end we had the, the Minister of Finance came back and he walked up before it's time for him to give his closing remarks and he, I think it was there that he said to me, you know, when I got the invitation for this workshop, I asked, why do they want to talk to me about climate change? Why aren't they talking to Pickersgill, the, the Minister of Environment? Right. And he said, but now I've sat through this and oh. now I want to know why they haven't been talking to me about this for Interesting. 15 years. Interesting. So it's an economic growth issue, it's a development right. issue, but we've we need to get it out of the box of the environment. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so helping people understand that, and then you get into the, once you agree that you want to do that, then you've got to bring these different ministries and departments together. That can be challenging. Yeah. Um, and I like, to, or we like to work from a national development plan so that we're really embedding the climate, the climate issues into the countries' development ambitions so that mm -hmm. we're keeping them on their development pathway. Mm -hmm. um, you get into risks of how good is the development plan, how up-to-date is it, how much stakeholder buy-in was there. Um, the Jamaica one has been great. I believe it survived three elections and two changes of party. Um, mm -hmm. But in other places, yeah. it may not be that strong. But that's, right. that's a bit of the things that I think are important. Interesting. Thanks. So now, can I ask you a question? Sure, you bet, absolutely. And for the audience, we're going to switch back and forth. Michael has a tremendous amount of experience that um, we thought it would be good for her to, to share as well. Um, Michael, one of the keys to climate resilient development is, is connecting national planning and budgeting to local implementation. Um, and this can be a challenge. Uh, based on your work in the Eastern Caribbean and in Southeast Asia, have you seen some good practices for doing this? Yeah, no, I think that absolutely is a key component um, to establish and strengthen those critical linkages 
from the national to the local level and back. So ensuring that we have information and collaboration flowing really robustly in both directions. And in the Eastern Caribbean and Southeast Asia, you know, we were working to build resilience across multiple and diverse nations, ranging from small island states and communities, you know, as small as Petit Martinique, which is less than one square mile in size and has, you know, only 900 residents, to the expansive archipelago of Indonesia with its over 250 million citizens, uh, you know, making it the fourth, fourth most populous country in the world. And in each of these cases, we found that it was absolutely critical to take a strategic approach that includes providing tailored support at both the national level uh, to, um, like as you said, to really help national governments identify priority needs and opportunities for climate adaptation in the context of the country's greater development goals. And then um, providing support for piloting state-of-the-art approaches and activities at the local level, making sure they were getting the resources they needed uh, to test and refine solutions that would be sustainable in those places. So just maybe using Petit Martinique as an example, it was, it was really interesting because over the last 20 to 30 years, uh, the community had been watching this progression of climate change impacts uh, threaten really their existence, uh, starting with the bleaching of these, these really lovely coral reefs that protected their island community. And once those reefs had, had bleached and died and started eroding away, it made vulnerable the mangroves uh, that fringed their island and provided that second layer buffer from, from currents, very strong currents around their coastlines, from storm impacts. And you know, over the next decade, they saw the loss of their mangrove forest in their, in their community. And once that happened, the waves and the currents um, you know, that were becoming stronger and stronger started eroding away their shorelines very, very quickly to the point where uh, it was threatening the one road that connected the 900 people that lived on that island and the one power plant that provided power to everyone on the island. Uh, it was within the next five to 10 years, those were both in danger of being eroded away. So we started working with the government of Grenada, which includes Petit Martinique and five other islands, to you know, really, as you kind of outlined, helping it identify the priority needs, pilot activities, and public-private partnerships to leverage additional resources toward you know, taking these local actions. And, and the government identified the community of Petit Martinique as a top priority, and uh, we supported the community in bringing on a world-class coastal engineering firm to design coastal protection measures that not only stopped the erosion, but uh, caused the accretion of sand back onto the shore so that a lot of the precious land they had lost was now starting to be recovered. Um, and the community really led this entire effort. And they're now uh, building a, a community park on the large area of land that's been reclaimed, uh, as well as working on how to, to further protect the rest of their coastline that, that could be potentially in jeopardy with future climate impacts. And Grenada and Petit Martinique are now sharing what they've learned and achieved with other island nations in the region and learning from the work that those nations have done as well um, so that they can all kind of together scale up successful approaches both within their companies and regionally through this very critical peer-to-peer -peer learning, which I think is another very important component of connecting kind of national planning, national budgeting down to the local level and having that feedback is, is building in you know, time and resources so that people can, can share what they're learning and what they're excited about and what they're worried about at a peer-to-peer -peer level, you know, from local communities and local businesses to local governments and national ministers. That really is an absolutely key component that we found. So with that, I have another question for you, John, if that's okay. okay. All right. And this is a question that I bet you get a lot because, um, you know, I ask myself this a lot in, in working on something as, as, poor, as important but as, as maybe thematically diverse as the concept of resilience. And that is, um, you know, of course, it's very important that in everything we do, we measure what the impacts are and we measure what progress we're making. And when we talk about climate resilient development, um, how do you think we should be measuring resilience and maybe climate resilience in particular? And you know, what indicators should we be using to track progress that countries and communities are making related to climate resilience, resilient development? Mm -hmm. um, that's a good question. It's a 
tough one, but thank you for asking. <laughs> um, it is one that we, we grapple with a lot. Um, so with adaptation, we are, again, we're dealing with a stress, not some positive thing we're working toward. We want to reduce vulnerability. We want to enhance development outcomes. Um, in the face of a given stress or shock, but we don't want to see those every year. We hope not to see category three or four hurricanes hitting every year. And they don't, fortunately. And so we can't measure our intervention against the, the event that we're trying to design it for. So I think what we need to do and what we do is look to implement good practices that are robust to a variety of stresses and shocks. Mm -hmm. Right. And build the capacity in the countries where we work uh, to understand the risks they face and make decisions that will uh, sort of inoculate them against those risks. And so I think our indicators, instead of being really outcome oriented, because the outcome we're looking for is a positive response in the face of a shock, the indicators need to look at are we introducing good practices um, that should build resilience in the face of stresses and shocks? And um, are we building capacity in country to do these things? And if you, I think you can look up the AID web, uh, AID uh, indicators online. Um, and we have things like um, institutional capacity built. Um, and we're developing ways of testing that, sort of doing pre and post tests um, so that we can actually measure the change in capacity. Um, we have things uh, indicators like uh, change in the number of decisions that are incorporating weather and climate information. Um, we're also working with colleagues at DFID and the bank and other donor agencies to try to learn from them and also align our indicators with theirs so that we could even, you know, sometime in the future perhaps begin comparing across agencies if, where we have different approaches. Are there things that we could learn uh, across different donor agencies? Great. Excellent. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Let's do one more question, you and me, and then we're okay. getting some good questions from webinar participants. And I'll, so we'll let's, let's then we'll take a question, at least one, from webinar participants. And please, uh, I know you're all having some really good thoughts on this stuff, so please chime in with your questions, and we'll get to those right after the next one. So, Michael, you mentioned the private sector in, the, in your previous discussion about um, the Caribbean and Southeast Asia. What do you see as the role of the private sector in building resilience, and what are some good ways to engage the private local, well, private sector actors um, to leverage additional resources? Yeah, that's that's a really good question, um, and something I'm kind of asking myself every day because I, I think we've all recognized at this point that that all of the money that governments and donors and other development partners can contribute to this cause is not going to be enough to, to address these challenges that uh, all of us have to face. And the private sector absolutely has a critical role to play and huge resources at stake when it comes to climate change. Uh, for example, in Asia and the Pacific alone, where um, climate change threatens more land, people, and economies than anywhere else in the world, Businesses across all industries have assets, operations, and supply chains that are, that are being directly affected right now, from electric grids and transportation infrastructure to the droughts and floods that interrupt their production cycles to the health of their workers. Uh, climate change is affecting their corporate bottom lines in almost every way. And you know, John, I'm sure you saw the recent findings from the Asian Development Bank indicating that by 2100, climate impact could cost some Asian nations uh, up to 12% of their GDP each year, uh, which is absolutely huge. And with this type of information coming out more and more these days, private sector leaders are absolutely motivated con to contribute greater, to contribute resources toward greater resilience. So in order to facilitate that, uh, one thing we're doing is working with countries to do the hard economic analysis that's needed to make the business case for climate adaptation. So showing how taking strategic actions right now and making smart investments now can build the adaptive capacity of communities and contribute to the overall resilience of a country's social and economic systems, um, making it stronger not only to climate shocks, but also to the many other non-climate stressors you know, that you noted people are facing. And, uh, 
my colleagues and I at APT have done this work most recently in Vietnam, the Philippines, Kazakhstan, Mexico, Colombia, and elsewhere with some really exciting results. And we're now expanding this work with other countries, continuing a strong focus on engaging private sector partners, uh, ministries of finance, which you, know, you said is, are so important, and, um, and working with them to direct and leverage uh, the very important private sector capital flows uh, toward building greater resilience. So I think that that is something that we really have a tremendous opportunity on it and need to continue uh, shifting our attention toward more and more uh, these days. So you know, with that, John, I'd love to ask you, um, we got a really interesting question. Um, uh, from our webinar participants. I'm not sure who this came from, but it's, it's to the heart of what you were kind of talking about earlier with regard to the development, climate resilient development framework, and that is how does USAID plan to implement this framework? Will it be, for example, through specific climate change projects or by incorporating climate change adaptation in other sectors? And also, um, Here's a, this person may have some inside information. When will the frameworks annexes be available? That was, that was from Santiago. Thank you, Santiago. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so we've been implementing it, testing it, trying it out um, for several years. Uh, we sort of made it up as we went in the work, the early work in Barbados. Um, we, I think, the the biggest, the biggest case was in Jamaica where we were trying to develop a, the national policy. Um, we've used it at the community level in Nepal and in Peru um, where uh, several villages in Nepal were developing LAFA's local adaptation plans of action and we were able to work with them using this framework so they could put the risks that they're facing in the context of the, the livelihood activities that they're engaged in. Um, we also uh, use it in the sectoral level, in a, in a sec sectoral context in the Philippines, looking at uh, the water utility in uh, the city of Iloilo. Um, we're rolling it out. I mean, ultimately, we make an impact when our missions take up something and use it. And so we have a training component to our Washington office. And they have trained hundreds of our field staff um, over the last two or three years. Hmm. I think I heard that they had trained 200 people this year alone. Wow, that's great. Um, and the shift is is happening. Um, I think they said that only 30% of those 200 people, I guess 60 roughly, um, were environment officers. The others were from other components of the agency uh, of the of the mission. So uh, economic growth, agriculture, etc. Um, on the question on the annexes. Oh, gosh, very soon, I hope. The water annex is being formatted. Um, the coastal annex, we're making some final changes. Um, I think we're, going, we're doing one on uh, governance that's in review. We're doing one on security or peace building that we're basically just formatting and making a few final tweaks to. Um, the problem is that as we get closer to finishing, it seems like we get into that whole problem of having the distance to the goal line. Right. And there's an infinite number of halves. But we are getting close. Um, I think the order will probably be order will be water, coastal, maybe uh, security and peace building, then governance, and then gender and disadvantaged populations. Got it. Great. Thank you so much for that. Sure. So now I'm going to turn it on you. Um, so Michael, uh, you've moved around quite a bit in the last few years. Uh, in your work, in your international work, what's the level of intellectual resistance that you've found um, to the notion that the climate is changing and is now more variable? Do you see the same types of resistance that we see here in the US? And that's from uh, Charlie. Well, Charlie, that's a very interesting question. And you know, one that really didn't even occur to me, I just moved back to um, the US uh, within the last few months, having been living and working on these issues overseas for a number of years. And um, you know, it, working on these issues with developing countries, uh, there really is absolutely no intellectual resilience to the notion that the climate is changing. You know, these countries are seeing and experiencing those impacts every single day. There's just no doubt that it's happening. There's no discussion of it. Uh, the discussion is all about 
how do how how are things changing? What can we expect in the future, and what can we do about it? What resources are available to us? Um, so I you know the only I, I've I've traveled a lot, worked in in Europe and other developed countries as well, and um, the only place I've really observed that uh, intellectual resistance is in the United States. And so uh, John, you know I'd be interested in your thoughts, but. That it's just not even people don't spend their time on this. You know, they have much more important things in in these countries we're working with, and that is, you know, how do we adapt to these impacts? Yeah, and Charlie, I would say that in some cases the problem goes the other way, where we see people um, attributing basic fundamental problems to climate change, where it's not the climate. I had someone in Nepal tell me that um, now that they had been sensitized, they understood that. Uh, climate change was causing slashes in agriculture. I hope that that was a, a linguistic problem and not that the, really what they were thinking. We heard that it was causing, uh, we've heard that it's causing earthquakes and other things. So if anything, in a lot of the places where we work, they go the other, to the other extreme of over attributing things to climate. And that can be a problem when it, when the source of the problem is solvable problems that they could undertake on their own. Hmm. Um, right. instead of some exogenous force that's, that's harming them. Right, yeah, good point. Okay, John, we've got another really interesting question from uh, one of our webinar participants. These are great. Um, please, everyone, keep your questions coming. Uh, I've got a bunch of other questions I, I wrote down to ask John, but I, I'm finding yours much more interesting. So this question is from Marcy. Um, what countries, John, have you seen that are doing a great job integrating adaptation planning into development planning? What best practices are you seeing that that we and others might be able to learn from here? Um, well, I'm going to I'm going to speak at a couple of different levels and probably not in a de too much detail because I don't want to you know talk out of school get you know seem to know more about some places than I do. Um, like I said earlier, Jamaica, I think, has done a great job because they've really engaged multiple ministries. And the way they've structured the way they're addressing climate change is they're, they're putting responsibility for dealing with it in the line ministries that are responsible for key economic sectors. So each line ministry, transportation, energy, agriculture, et cetera, has to come up with its own uh, work plan for addressing climate risks and mitigation opportunities. They've identified climate change focal points in each of the ministries and departments responsible. So they're really um, sharing responsibility uh, outside of the, the, um, the environment ministry. Um, we're going to start seeing a lot of countries moving ahead on this. The, the, the UNFCCC is in the early stages of something called the NAP process, the National sure. Adaptation Planning Process. It sort of grew out of the idea of the NAPAs, which you may be familiar with from last decade. NAPAs were National Adaptation Programs of Action. They were meant to identify urgent and immediate needs. Um, and the NAPs are meant to look sort of into the middle and longer time scales and do a better job of mainstreaming climate into development. Um, and so I think we're going to start seeing more. Uh, it's a fairly, it's fairly new, it's early stages of the process. Um, there's a few donors, a few bilateral donors are beginning to jump in and start helping countries. We've been working with GIZ, um, and we're, there are a number of processes that are not dissimilar from the, the climate resilient framework that, that Michael and I walked through earlier. So I think you'll start seeing more soon. Um, Malawi has a has taken this very seriously hmm. um, and is in the early stages of developing a plan. I believe Bangladesh has developed a plan. Um, and we have heard that Vietnam and Cambodia are quite interested. And I'm probably just forgetting a number of them. And I apologize to those countries. Oh, that's good to know. Thank you. So Michael, um, I understand you and Others at APT are taking an evidence-based approach to addressing resilience in your development programs. What does that mean to APT and to your work personally? Okay, good question. Yeah, 
Um, Evidence-based approach. You know, to me that means that uh, ensuring all of my projects are using the best available research and information on how climate change is affecting and will affect the communities and countries we're working with and making sure that our activities are constantly incorporating lessons learned from our work and the work of others globally on these issues because, you know, John, as you know, our collective knowledge is constantly changing and improving on, these, on this stuff and the challenges that we face are absolutely tremendous. Um, so maybe just as an example, when we look at food security, we know that 85% of global fisheries are seriously overexploited at this point and many are near collapse. And on the terrestrial side, uh, we know that climate change impacts are likely to reduce the production of staple food crops such as rice, wheat, and corn by as much as, you know, say 50% in some areas of the world by 2050. However, also by 2050, the world is going to need to produce enough food to feed 2 billion additional people on the planet. And that demand is starkly out of line with what we know will be available. So, you know, APT is a very evidence-driven organization and we're constantly tracking these types of trends and working with partners to test new approaches and scale up what's working to address these and other issues. And, you know, related to food security, climate resilient agriculture is one of the areas that we're really focusing on right now alongside my personal area of focus, uh, which right now is the nexus between climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Uh, something that I worked on quite a bit with small island nations in the Eastern Caribbean and which APT is addressing with some particularly vulnerable countries in Asia and elsewhere around the world. So I think having an evidence-based uh, approach is, is just really crucial because our knowledge is changing so quickly um, on these issues, uh, more so than we even understood. So I, I think that's something really important kind of for all of us uh, to keep in mind. So. Um, We've got a couple coming in from our uh, webinar participants as well. Um, but before we get to those, John, there's one that is just kind of burning for me. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the harsher realities that many countries are facing related to climate change impacts, uh, such as sea level rise, flooding, saltwater intrusion to freshwater drinking off aquifers, loss of agricultural land, changes in water resources, all of this really kind of happening in the midst of, you know, this ongoing population growth that we've been talking about, as well as urbanization, these food security issues. You know, what do you think is really needed to help these countries that are most vulnerable adapt to these very serious impacts that they're experiencing and will experience? Uh, thanks, Michael. That's a <laughs> tough, tough one, one. <laughs> but thank you. Um, well, I think, again, as I said earlier, I think it's important to put the climate stresses in the context of other challenges. Um, climate may compound some problems. Uh, um, other problems may simply undermine any ability to grow or develop at all. And so, you know, there's a there's an architect named Bill McDonough who says if you're trying, if you're leaving Washington and trying to go to New York, and you're seeing signs for Richmond, Atlanta, Miami the first best thing is to just stop. So if you're doing something that's harming you, stop. And it's, it's important to help countries see and understand what it is they may be doing that's harming them. Uh, I was talking to some people from an organization that was working in the Pacific. Uh, an island was experiencing worse and worse uh, coastal flooding and erosion. And they were um, digging up corals from offshore and putting them on the beach to protect the beach. And so this organization said, you know, the first thing you could do is stop removing your natural barrier to wave erosion. Um, and you need to understand, the country, we need to help countries understand what those things might be. Um, and we need to look at the multiple challenges and opportunities for growth and development uh, in a context with each other and um, help people pursue the, the opportunities that may be less at risk from climate. I think we also need to remember that all these changes, all these shocks aren't going to occur at once. There may be a lot of positive development that can occur over time, even if at some point uh, it may get too hot in a place or the sea may get too high in a place for an aquifer to continue to perform. If you stop over pumping an aquifer now, 
it may last a lot longer than if you don't. And so I think we need to think again in multiple time scales. And what can we do now? And what can we do to protect us for the future? Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more with you on that. That's exactly right. So Michael, can you talk to us a little bit about, this is from uh, Philip, um, what are, are agencies, governments, departments, um, depending on the same financial resources to, to address both climate change resilience or adaptation, as well as climate change mitigation? And if so, where should the priorities be placed? And I, I would guess that that question would go to both uh, donor governments and host country governments. Yeah, yeah, I know, John and Philip, actually, that's a really important point that I think, you know, especially when we talk about, um, especially when we talk about uh, national agencies, national governments, departments in developing countries, and the financial resources that they're relying on, you know, to address some of the risks and vulnerabilities related to climate change, um, they do have very limited, you know, internal governmental resources to address. This. And, and that's where I, I think it's, it's really important um, for us and, and others who are working in this field to also focus some of our attention on supporting governments in, in readiness, essentially, which is a term we use to describe them being ready to accept the, the tremendous resources that have been committed by countries, the United States, European countries, other developed countries, to help developing countries adapt to these changes. Um, there are billions of dollars out there in, in different climate funds, uh, commitments that have been made, money that uh, regional development banks from the Asian Development Bank, Caribbean Development Bank, and others are, are ready and waiting and need to get out to, um, to bankable, uh, effective projects on the ground in these, in these vulnerable countries. Um, but there's a lot of capacity building that needs to happen in these countries at the national uh, level and local level to be able to bring um, really ready projects to banks and to investors and donors uh, to get those funds. Donors and banks are asking a lot from countries in terms of um, performance management systems, I'm sorry, yeah, and, and indicators and tracking progress and, you know, making sure that the dollars that they would invest or are investing are having a very meaningful impact. And as we talked about earlier, measuring impact is a difficult thing when we talk about climate adaptation and resilience. But those are exactly the types of things that countries need, need to be able to do in order to access and receive the, the significant resources that are out there for them. So that's something else that we're focusing on here is that, that readiness piece, helping countries be really ready to, um, to tap into and access that international climate financing that's out there. So uh, we only have about four more minutes. Um, and we have a question coming in from uh, a webinar <laughs> participant, uh, thank you so much, related to climate information services. And John, um, this is something that you mentioned earlier. Um, and I think it's something we maybe we don't talk about enough, um, in that one of the really important resources that countries and communities need in order to adapt to climate impacts is information about how the climate is changing. Um, so can you tell us, um, and thank you for this question, um, what is the state of climate information in developing countries, and what is USAID and the U.S. government doing to help? Um, thanks. Um, well, the state of the availability of weather and climate information in developing countries is pretty mixed. Um, like I said earlier, often the, well, maybe I didn't say it, often the weather service, the National Weather Service in a country is underfunded. It's often a result of um, the, the budget process, the people responsible for that, not understanding how weather and climate information gets used or how it's valuable to a uh, to the economy. Um, and so they seem they, they are sometimes kind of the untended agency or ministry, it's not a ministry, agency or office in a country. Um, we like to think about uh, the use of information that, as a kind of a value chain that runs from data collection, whether it's um, on the ground weather stations or satellites, um, all the way down to the decision maker who gets information and hopefully makes a better decision. And along the way in that chain, you've got to have functioning weather stations, 
you've got to have databases to store the data coming out of those stations, right. computers and people to analyze that information. Somebody's got to understand the decision-making style and needs of the clients for that information so that tools and information can be developed and then get translated into terminology that the decision maker can use. Right. Um, and all of that can be complicated. And then you've got to get the information out to people. And in the places where USAID works, often there's a real communication challenge. People aren't online right. necessarily. So we're trying to work with people to address some of those risks. I talked a bit about Jamaica, and I know we're short on time, so I'm going to kind of skip over some of that and just say that back in September, uh, President Obama announced a new partnership for climate hmm. data and information. Yeah. Um, there was a request for information posted the other day on FedBizOps. Uh, it's a request for information. There's not a procurement right now. Um, and there will be blog posts from USAID and I think the Office of Science and Technology for Policy soon. Um, and the, the purpose of that partnership is to try to build on some of the work we've already been doing and that some of our very strong uh, government partners at NOAA and NASA have been doing. Um, and bring in more partners, new skill sets, um, new capacities to expand and improve uh, the, the delivery of these weather and climate services in, in, in developing countries. I want to say last thing, I want to make a pitch for USAID's monthly adaptation community meeting. Uh, yes. um, it's tomorrow. The topic will be a NOAA-funded project called IRAP, yeah. which I believe stands for Integrated Research and Assessment Project. Yeah. Um, they've been focusing in their first year in the Caribbean. They've done some very neat work, including support for that drought tool that I mentioned. Um, it's tomorrow uh, from 4 to 5.30 at the Carnegie Endowment, which is at 1779 Mass Avenue. Right. When you go into Carnegie, they can tell you which room it's in. Um, there's also going to be a webcast of it, but I don't know the address right now. Hmm. Um, maybe people can email one of us and yeah. get it to them. Yeah, definitely. Um, this has been so good, and we have a number of other great questions that have come in from webinar participants, um, which, John, I hope you can stay after so we can just keep talking about this, because <laughs> these are really good points. Thank you, everyone. We're unfortunately at the end of our uh, hour-long session here, um, but it's just been really fantastic to be able to have this kind of global dialogue and exchange with you. So I just really appreciate you taking the time. As John mentioned when we started, I hope, I hope you found this worthwhile uh, for your time. Um, I'll just say as we wrap up here uh, that our next session in the series will be January 22nd, exploring how to boost financial resilience by helping households build assets and strengthen their balance sheets followed by our 20, February 26th session focused on mental health and well-being, and our April 21st session looking at strengthening communities through risk avoidance, mitigation, and response. Um, and I think that uh, you have here on the screen uh, my email address. Um, let's continue the conversation. Let's continue it on Twitter as well, which is a just a really delightful platform for sharing information. Um, and, you know, John, uh, thanks so much, again, for taking the time to be with us. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks to APT, and thanks to all the people in the audience. This was fun. Okay. Thank you.